All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Retail Power Hour with Constant Contact. Um, with the COVID crisis closing doors to brick and mortar businesses and restricting face-to-face -face interactions, uh, retail, wholesale, and even distribution businesses have shifted to an online business model, completely changing the way that they've ever done business before. So today, Constant Contact is extremely proud to moderate a conversation um, and what we're calling our Retail Power Hour between Boston-owned retail-like businesses to discuss the challenges they faced, ways that they've overcome these challenges, and the most important tools or activities that they've used to power through what seems like the most difficult time for small businesses today. My name is Jenna Schaefer. I am a marketing manager at Constant Contact, and I will be your panel moderator for today. And I am joined by my colleague, Matthew Montoya, to help me facilitate today's conversation, as well as a couple of our fantastic retail, like, <laughs> and I, I put that in quotes for a specific reason, but our retail customers. So I do want to make a note that we're using the term retail pretty loosely today. I know that we're referring to businesses that are selling actual products or, or products based services. So, um, but some of our panelists today have unique business models that aren't specific to retail per se, but maybe even business to business products and, and services as well. So I just want to put that out there and I'll let you. I'll let them tell you a little bit more about their businesses in detail. But what we're going to do is we're going to start off with um, having our panelists introduce themselves and to share a little bit more about their business. Um, so let's go ahead and have Matt start us off and just introduce yourself why you're here as one of our co-facilitators. Sure. Um, well, thanks for having me, and thank you to our panelists for for being here today. Um, I am a channel marketing and enablement manager at Constant Contact, and basically what that means is that I educate our customers, our clients. Um, my particular part of the business is more in the franchise side of the business. So if we're talking about retail and B two B, it's going to be more of the franchise model. Um, but I'm just so excited to have uh, have the two of you here today to share your knowledge and your experience, and uh, couldn't be happier. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Amy, do you want to start us off and again, just share who you are, um, what your business is, what you sell, and uh, why don't you walk us through the process, at least from your perspective, um, a little bit of pre-COVID, what your business was like then, uh, walking us through what it was like during uh, the lockdown and maybe the, the current state of affairs with your business now. Okay. Uh, so my name's Amy Jesuits. Uh, I am one of the owners of a retail clothing shop called Nature's Closet. Slash, we had also attached to it a smoothie shop called Ooh. the Smoothie Spot. Uh, okay. We're in Williamstown, Massachusetts, uh, which is a small college town uh, in the corner northwest corner of Massachusetts near New York State and Vermont. Um, we're probably in, we're a little bit different than some folks. Uh, my business partner and I actually just bought the business in January. Oh, how exciting. Congratulations. Uh, yes. It, it, it's a business that's been um, around for almost, probably this year would have been their 19th or 20th year. So well established within the community. Uh, so that part I would say for us has actually been good because it has been here um, in our part of the country at that time January February March are generally our slowest months of the year so business for us at that time was slow to begin with okay um, we're very tourist driven in the area where we are um, so it's you know, if, like I said, it was slow anyway. Um, the college for us, which is a, it's Williams College here, is a very big driver uh, economically, uh, along with some of the other cultural institutions that we have in the area, which typically most of them do the bulk of their um, shows and things during the summer months. So, when we when kind of the shutdown happened uh which was mid-march here in massachusetts um they sent the college kids home and everything really kind of went on lockdown um we 
we never really closed. Um, our business was closed, but still my uh, business partner, Beth, she went in every day and was there. Uh, we really tried to get the word out to people um, in that respect. I mean, we we closed down the smoothie spot side. We completely shut down that aspect, but we kept the clothing part open. And we sell, uh, we're an outdoor specialty retailer, so we really focus on uh, Patagonia, uh, Solomon, uh, Prana, things like for outdoor active lifestyle. Um, so we had at that point a lot of the things that people were really looking to get um, because of really the as still is the case really the best place to be was outside doing something being active uh, you know just that's what you could do so in that respect during march and april Beth went in every day and was there and we really focused on using social media and also email marketing to communicate with people. Um, you know, we have an email list that, you know, we've been trying to do better with since all of this has happened. Cause you know, we had a lot of folks too who maybe didn't necessarily live in the area, um, but were on it. So, but we found we would push out information about what we had available. Uh, we did virtual shopping which we're still offering all of these things. We've just kind of kept it in the loop, although it's not getting used as much, but we would do virtual shopping with people. By that, I mean, we would use FaceTime or whatever other means to, Beth would walk around the shop with her phone and show people things. And uh, then we would either do local delivery or we would set it up and let people come and, you know, do like a curbside pickup. Um, okay. So. And then gradually, as uh, the state of Massachusetts kind of started to open up, I think, I can't remember the specific dates, but I think it was closer into May, they allowed some of the retail shops to then kind of open, but not have people in them. So people could come and do more curbside uh, type activities and things. So we've... Uh, we found that really worked well for us in using, yes, social media and the email was handy. Um, our vendors that we work with were very supportive. Uh, a lot of them reached out to us, uh, letting us know what they had set up in regards to just payment things um, or different um you know, some of them were, we could order and they would directly drop ship to customers for us. Um, anything that they had, even if it was things that we didn't carry, if someone wanted it, they would, we could, they could order it through us and drop ship it. And uh, there's a, we haven't, we have a web page. We don't really have a complete online shopping set up. So that's something that I've been working on since I'm at home most of the time, uh, but we have, we're partnering with some of our vendors who use a, a platform called locally.com. Um, and there's all different, it depends, you know, I, a lot of our outdoor sporting vendors use that. Um, so it integrates our POS system and our inventory that we have, and it automatically, once you get it set up, it will populate your page on locally.com so that people can see what your inventory is. And then they can actually set up and shop through there. Um, we haven't 100% pulled the plug on that yet, but we're working towards that because I think there's definitely going to be more online shopping and you know the bulk of our business has always been coming into the store that's been the nature of it so doing online shopping for us is kind of a new venture and we're kind of we've gradually been getting into it but with that from our vendors has been helpful um, and right now um you know we're we're open you know we have limits on the number of people who can be in the shop um, that's not necessarily really a problem for us because we're not one of those, you know, if we have a total of eight people in the store at one time, that's a lot. <laughs> so it's not a, not really a big deal for us in that respect. 
but uh, I think the thing for us is just the we everything stopped here so all of the cultural activities the theater all of that is not happening right now so we have a lot less uh, traffic coming to our community uh, the museums just did reopen in the past like two or three weeks uh, but again they're not doing their big shows we are finding that we are getting a lot of um, day trip people from say within an hour radius of where we live uh, so sales are definitely down um, but it's you know we're trying to be creative we're managing and i think that's that's the biggest thing from this is we're definitely it has allowed us to take advantage of some of the downtime that we've had and look at okay what are the things we think we can fix or improve on or we've been wanting to do this but haven't had the time and i think uh, businesses that can do that and take advantage of that will be the ones who are going to be able to come out of this on the other end. So wonderful, great. Thanks for sharing. Um, and you've you've actually touched on a lot of points that I would love to get back to today. So I'm glad that you brought those up because I definitely want to dive a little bit deeper into some of those creative ways that you've you know or the things that you've been trying to to do now that you have a little bit more time to do it. But I do want to give Jim a chance to tell us a little bit about his business model. I know Jim, yours is a little bit different. You're not a traditional retail store. You sell products, but um, you have a different business model. So um, if you want to unmute yourself, you can go ahead and share a little bit about what you've been doing, um, your business, uh, your business model, and how things have been progressing through the COVID crisis. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having me, Jenna. Um, Amy, it was great to hear about Nature's Closet. I, I find that really interesting. Um, what a great business, and I'm glad you guys are are doing okay. So we're uh, we're Calico distributors, and um, I'm the marketing manager for a company of about 65 employees. We're located in in at Taunton, Mass, between Cape Cod and Boston, and um, we are uh, we distribute. Um, it, we're a redistributor, so not only are we in uh, the middle of the supply chain? We're B2B, but not just B2B. We uh, only sell to other distributors. Uh, so we're, we don't sell to end users. And the things that we sell, there are two segments to our business. Janitorial supply. So we sell janitorial supply to other, other janitorial suppliers, and they sell into the next channel down. Um, that's one segment and the other is food service disposables things you would need um, at a restaurant uh, you know anything from plastic cutlery all the napkins anything paper product all the paper cups like if uh, if nature's closet needed to clear uh, 16 ounce uh, you know cups with lids uh, they might get it from a supplier that we supply that's sort of our role in the in the um, in the business so just prior to the to our pre-COVID status was um, how it was different is that we really rely on the seasonal tourism industry on the restaurant side, on the food service side. We sell through to uh, the uh, resorts of, uh, you know, we're here in the Northeast, New England, the Cape Cod and Islands um, resort season, as well as New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont, uh, Western Mass, you know, we kind of rely on that um, in that peak. So we, we've been hurt a little bit because things haven't fully opened up. Uh, we've tried to adapt and, and uh, offer more things for the takeout uh, industry. Um, and then so pre-COVID, uh, you know, versus uh, post-COVID, what we've had to do is not rely on our sales team so much once the lockdown or the, you know, the pandemic really hit. We could, our sales force could no longer go out and physically um, meet with um, with other distributor customers like they normally do, and so that's where constant contact came in uh, because that became our number one channel. Um, and for a variety of reasons, we don't do a lot of social media marketing. Uh, there are problems with it because 
we're strictly not supposed to be uh, marketing to end users. So when you when you broadcast your social media, you sort of invite uh, you know the, the general public, which is fine. But our promise to our distributor customers is to stay in our own lane and only sell through to um, distributors. So, uh, but uh, constant contact has really allowed us to um, to remain relevant and in front of our customers like no other channel has, and that's because rather than our sales force going out, we would will. This is the, our continual process of where we're still doing. You know, we'll launch um, an email and uh, we'll inform everyone uh, at our company internally, and they'll follow up with a phone call. Hey, did you get the the email on the hand sanitizers, the um, the new trigger pumps, the all the things you actually need in um, in this pandemic. Uh, you know, moment we're in. And so that's been working great. So they follow up and they, they enter their notes into a sales force and it, it becomes a pretty tight cycle, a, a really good loop. And as our, our president owner <clears throat> has sort of stressed, we're, we're sort of, we've sort of shifted our, um, our strategy to learn, to lean really uh, more on constant contact than we ever have before. It's become our main channel. Um, because just like I said, sales guys can't, or the, our sales force can't go out and, and visit physically. They can. Um, so, so for us, it, uh, constant contact has been working fantastically. That's good news. <laughs> That's what it's there for, right? <laughs> yes. Well, so I want to dive a little bit deeper into because from what both of you said, there's this level of um, traffic that's driven to your business by almost tourism or being brought in from other areas and you've replaced that with some more online efforts. Um, maybe you mentioned even like FaceTime and um, being able to shop online and Jim, it sounds like you have uh, some of the music constant contact to replace those face-to-face -face impressions. Yeah. Have you mute yourself? I'm getting that feedback there in the background. Thank you. Um, so I do want to I want to ask a little bit more about those efforts. So um, you know maybe the the new ways that you've been communicating with your consumers um, and how they've responded to those. So I know you've shared a little bit, but uh, Amy, do you want to to speak on that a little bit more? Sure. So we, you know, we we're trying to think about who our customers are, and again, we're dealing like with the end user. You know, we have people who are looking for product, but we, being in a college town like we are, we have, you know, the age group of people that we're dealing with um, runs from 20 to on up into because we do live in an ha, also have an older community. We're dealing with people who are in their 60s and 70s. So how do you reach that broad of a range of people and what works best? So we've, you know, we found that our younger clients, customers, uh, they're definitely much more into the social media, um, Instagram, Facebook. So we, we use that to communicate with them for the most part. Um, but then we have found for our, you know, probably getting into the 45, 55, 60-ish bracket, those are the folks who really use their desktop computer, computers and are using, we find we get a better response with them with the emails um, through the constant contact. And that has been, so we kind of target, I guess you'd say, what we're using in our emails toward maybe a different crowd than what we are using on our Instagram and Facebook pages. Um, so it's been, you know, it's been a learning curve on how to do it well. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, I think as time has gone on, you know, we, we figured out definitely I like in the fact of constant contact, you know, when you can go back in and see the analytics from your email that was sent and how many clicks and what's open, even just that basic information for me, because I'm, 
I'm by no means a computer wizard or I mean I can email and search and do all that but I'm not necessarily into you know the diving into the deep analytics of things but I can look back and say okay on this email that I did that didn't work so well by looking at how the clicks or if I rephrase it and I like the little tips that come up on how to say things better those are helpful I mean if you actually read them they do work so um I had, we were doing like a once a week email and we started that back, you know, I think it was probably in April where we really were like, okay, this is going to go on. And we started doing that and we definitely would generate um, people, you know, emailing back to us by using the link in the email mm -hmm. or, um, you know, some folks would call to set up a virtual appointment or something like that. So it's been, you know, we've, figuring it out, but it's it's been helpful for sure. Great. How about you, Jim? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's yeah, okay. that's a really uh, interesting tactic, Amy. The uh, the virtual shopping app was very uh, a creative adaption. I don't have anything on par like that. Uh, but um, I can also relate to the, the age demographics uh, as far as desktop versus uh, adoption of social media. We're an old company and we're an old industry. Um, the uh, the owners are small business owners. Our customers are small business owners of about five employees or so, and um, they kind of look like me. You know, they're they're like uh, older guys in their fifties and uh, and upwards, and tend to be male. And um, they sit on a desktop all day because they have to. It's part of their job to analyze purchases, to shop around. Um, so, you know, they're not they're not as mobile as a younger demographic. Um, and they're not um, they're not entrenched in any social media with maybe the exception of LinkedIn. Um, and uh, uh, so that's just one of the, the fundamental differences. But other than that, we've um, I wanted to ask about frequency of email sent because I think lately we have upped um, you know our our send rate to maybe twice a week um, and I think our customers accept that because we have such a close relationship and they're kind of expecting communications for us uh, they like to know what's new um, so we might be breaking that best practices uh, notion of uh, you know no more than once a week but um, I didn't know if anyone had any other experience. It seems to be working okay for us to go to twice a week now. Do you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was going to be thrown to me. Um, Jim, you know, the thing is, is you, you hit a couple of really key words there, which is, I mean, you talked about relevancy, and it's really about the relevancy. And so when you said that you, it seemed that your clients were accepting it, it's probably due to the fact that you were sending relevant content to them. They need to they need to resell the products. They need to have the content out there um, because that's helping their business. And uh, Jim, if you could mute one more time, um, it needs to be relevant to them. So it's very difficult in a in a in a roundtable discussion like this because things we say will suddenly become gospel um, when people start to watch it. But generally, yes, the once a week is a pretty good rhythm. But if you're providing a service that people find valuable and they find the email relevant to them, they'll be accept, uh, accepting of the frequency. Um, it's, you know, the, the old term I, I used to use back when I was able to do public speaking in public um, was, um, you know, there is an org there's an organization that I get uh, multiple emails a day from and I open almost every one and it's my stock broker. You know, if you said, hey, can I send three emails a day? Um, most people say, no, that's crazy. But that's extremely relevant content, and so it's it's all tied to the relevancy. So in your case, not everybody watching, but in your case, Jim, I would say that you're probably fine. Just monitor your unsubscribe rates and your open rates. If you start to see numbers go down, then you know maybe you need to massage the numbers. Right, that's a good point. Yeah. And Jenna, can I ask a follow-up question? Please, uh, please. Because I know that we're in the structure of today's discussion. We are going to talk about the future a little bit later, and I'm certain we'll, we'll get to that. But both of you have something really unique, and I'm sure you both picked up on it. And I have a feeling like this is going to be true amongst many of the people watching, which is seasonality. 
Um, both of you are so tied to seasonality. And, um, you know, one quick fun thing, Amy, is I've actually been to your shop. Um, once you once you mentioned the um, the other business, I was like, oh, I, I've been there. So I, I know exactly where you are. And I do know how seasonal you are. Um, Jim, I unfortunately haven't been out to you, but um, hopefully one day. But um, what are your plans, given the, the seasonal nature of your businesses, what are your plans as whatever's left of summer disappears and we move into what's likely a even slower time for you? How are you planning ahead, especially around your marketing? And we'll start, start with Amy. Okay. Uh, so we're actually, you know, at the moment, they're, they're saying that the students are going to come back to the college. So for us, we're, we're, we're hopeful uh, because we want them to come back. I mean, as community members, we have some concerns on the other side of that. Um, so if that happens, you know, I, I see our smoothie side being picking up in business because the, it's, the college students love it. Um, and, you know, we do well in the fall generally, so we're, we're hoping, because of the holidays coming up, um, trying to, right now, because again, in retail, you know, we're already, things for fall are coming in and winter. We're already thinking about buying for spring. Um, so we're, we're also trying to think about how to Kind of revisualize and market because we found that although we our focus has really been on clothing but thinking about the outdoor sporting activities that people do so we're looking into that and how we can maybe bring in some other products that we haven't carried and then marketing those to um you know the broader base not only college students but people who live in the area um and I want to get better with that, I guess, would be, you know, besides doing, we found that the once a week emails work pretty well for us. But again, our inventory doesn't change weekly based on things. So, um, you know, in that respect, we're, we're trying to think ahead to start advertising those things now, like maybe, not maybe in August, but maybe in September, the, hey, snow season's coming up. Think about getting some snowshoes now so that you have them when, so that we're just trying to maybe be, you know, 30 to 45 days ahead of when we think thing, when people will be looking for it. Start putting those ideas in their heads now instead of trying to catch up afterward, I guess, is our, what we're trying to be better at. Jim, I'm going to ask you the same question and the same question to you, but Amy just said something that's really specific to her uh, kind of business that I think might be interesting to uh, viewers, which is given the the extra piece that's happening here at the end of the year, which is the holidays, and how far back retail has to start planning for that. Are you planning on adjusting your schedule at all? Because when you said you're talking about maybe getting some winter wear out in September, if that's what piqued my, my mind in thinking, oh, how does a holiday planning work into this? Yeah, so there are parallels, and I found it, uh, it interesting that, you know, Amy mentioned uh, uh, some of those. Um, well, for instance, uh, here's a couple of promos that we do normally. We do uh, winter catering uh, that we have to gear up for, uh, winter catering products that we would uh, start maybe in, in September starting to market. Um, and they would be like uh, food trays, anything you'd need for a holiday catering event you know, uh, with Sterno and, and um, you know, food uh, warmers. But we also uh, have two others, and that's the cold and flu season. We normally rely on, because we're a big uh, supplier of Clorox, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, sanitizers and disinfectants and uh, everything you'd need to kind of prevent cold and flu season in schools. Um, so we might sell through to a distributor who would sell to, uh, colleges and we rely on uh, schools opening up just like Amy does uh, you know uh, we we could possibly have the same customers where we uh, sell through it to a distributor who also sells to Williams College but all the institutions in Massachusetts not just higher ed uh, but um, 
you know, K through 12, we rely on those institutions to open up. And we do have to make adjustments. Um, fortunately, one of those things that we don't have to adjust for, so if we, if we lose business on some of the winter and catering items, because holiday parties might not uh, be there like they were last year, um, ice melt is a big seller. Uh, you know, we sell through, we're, you know, a pretty viable channel to sell ice melt to institutions. So we would probably um, adjust and go heavy on some of those items. On the cold and flu promos, um, that we would probably have to adjust too because uh, interestingly in this COVID-19 pandemic period that we're in, we have, um, we've been limited by Clorox uh, supplies from Purell. Purell told us early on that even though we were a big supplier and uh, we were a great customer, that they were just gonna skip us uh, altogether because we're not you know, supplying the front lines, the hospitals and the, the critical institutions and the, the first responders that they need to. So, um, so we've had to dial back on that and find alternatives. And, and so the answer really is, um, yeah, we've definitely had to make adjustments on, on how we go out. Um, so it, leaning more toward uh, email than any other uh, channel or touch point. But we have also had to adjust um, what we're promoting heavily this this season. And Amy, did you? I mean, what do you what do you find with that kind of holiday planning and planning for the future? Yeah, I mean, we've one of the things that we've had to do just um, you know we're still having our orders come in, but we have cut back on some of the because we place pre-orders. So we ordered for fall and winter six months ago. Um, but we know that we're not going to have as many people in town. I mean, at, like I said, at, at the moment, students are scheduled to come back, but at Thanksgiving, they're leaving. They're going home and they're not gonna be back, I think until February. Um, but then the other thing that has happened to us that again, we rely a lot on influx of tourism for our, our business is there aren't going to be any sporting events through the college. So football, basketball, you know, whatever. I can't remember if it's field hockey or lacrosse, which one gets played when. Um, but those bring people into town. So we have in our, you know, we've cut back on some of our orders. Um, let me turn that off. So you know, the, that's what we have done. It's not that we're necessarily ordering more, but we are thinking about what are other things that people might want that we haven't traditionally carried in relationship to outdoor Hello. specialty um, stores. So again, you know, we've done snowshoes in the past, but it's not something that we do every year. But this year, I think we're going to because we've we definitely found an increase in just people wanting to get things um, that they can use outside and trying, you know, we, in regards to supply chain, we haven't had difficulty getting things, um, but I know when people want to try and order something from Amazon or one of the bigger companies, they can't get it as quick as they wanted to before or, um, things are running out. So as a local retailer, if we have it, the one thing about being in a small community like us is they, the people who live here want to support us. So if we have it, um, people will come and buy it from us. So that's really kind of the direction we're going in is seeing what we can add that we don't necessarily have, but still fits with our, our model for our shop. That's, I mean, that's interesting that you both have such different business models, but what I'm hearing is that you're both really leaning into, okay, this is kind of the realm in which we sell certain products, but we're, you know, we want to stay within that realm, but we're really leaning into what we think people might need during that time. Um, so that's, that's interesting to me. I'm, I'm curious, um, kind of piggybacking off of Matt's question, you know, thinking about the future and planning for the future, um, you know, should the pandemic continue and, you know, there are potential talks of a second wave coming and 
with that maybe a lot another lockdown um i'm curious it how your online mar marketing strategy or i guess just like your online shopping cart or e-commerce solutions have developed so did you have shopping carts or e-commerce solutions before that people could purchase through online did you add those through the pandemic or have you always had those kind of how has that online strategy changed or not changed for you and either one of you can start out <laughs> go ahead jim <laughs> sure um yeah we have uh, we've had an e-commerce uh web ordering platform i call it a web ordering platform because we don't really attract uh, the general public uh, once again we're we're kind of a wholesaler in the middle uh, not selling to end users. So you have to be a registered uh, distributor. You have to be registered in, uh, in a pretty much a regular customer. However, you, you know, a small portion. What's that? So you had that before, prior to yes, COVID? We've had, okay. we've had it before, but we're about to launch um, a new e-commerce platform. Uh, we're a couple weeks out from that. Um, and, you know, our, our plan is just to, just to double our numbers of, web purchasers you know we have some KPIs that we want to hit and um, uh, but as far as um, the only thing that we might do differently um, and that's developing now is is our understanding and use of social media which is different from for us because we once again we can't just broadcast to the general public we have a lot of things that are price sensitive that we uh, we don't want to uh, you know, get price uh, out there, um, and um, but there's a there's a way we're try we're slowly trying to figure this out. And actually, um, you know, I think I I'd like to be talking to Matt a little later uh, for some channel marketing strategy. That's his thing. So I'm I'm glad to be on this panel and then to meet Matt. Um, oh, one one other side note, it's sort of unrelated. I found it really interesting, Amy. Um, one of the big takeaways I've learned from your business is is the loyalty uh, to your to your shop nature's uh, nature's closet. That is fantastic. It's one of the things I I forget because if I were living in town um, and I had a chance to buy uh, Patagonia on one of the big you know retailers or or I knew Amy or um, uh, you know, or Beth, uh, I might prefer that. I mean, all things being equal, why wouldn't you want to support your local business? And also, you know, it's just, it's, so I think that there's that great aspect that, um, that you can exploit. And I love hearing that because I have a friend who has uh, not a, a similar business, small uh, in a region, uh, in a resort town on the Cape, Cape Cod, uh, who has that brand following, but uh, you know, doesn't take advantage of that online. You know, he's been around for 40 years and, and people return to him seasonally and they, uh, but I, I just think that's a great thing for me to learn and to really think about, so thank you. Great, so you, you're kind of doubling down on, on that uh, online e-commerce solutions and really going to lean into that, so that's great. Um, how about you, Amy, I'm sure it's more of a, local shop that's providing product to direct customers or consumers how, how has that worked for you so you know that really is i mean we have this clunky old kind of setup through our web page didn't get used often at all but it's been there um so that is something that we definitely want to do more of i think you know having an online shopping presence is definitely worthwhile um, even being a small little local retail shop so that's where like i said i've been working with the locally.com which a lot of our vendors have partnered with and you know trying to get that set up so that it'll it'll work better uh, for us into the future um, you know i i still envision once everything changes and we, the virus is under control you know still the bulk of our business will probably be people walking into our shop because we're just a we're a tourist place you know that's kind of how it is um but we do have 
again, the loyalty aspect of it. And the one thing that's nice for us going into that with some of our vendors, which we have been uh, using the, through the email marketing is, like I mentioned before, a lot of our vendors allow us to drop ship direct. So if it's something we don't necessarily carry, but say one of the vendors does, they can we can order it for them we still get the credit for it so it benefits us as being a, a small retailer but have it shipped to their house so we you know having a lot of alumni that come back from the campus they come in and see us so we have had people by sending those emails out and saying hey you know patagonia we can drop ship from them to you they'll send us an email and tell us what they want and we can put the order in and have it sent even for people who don't live in Williamstown but are familiar with our store. So that part, using the email and being able to get that word out has been, been helpful for us. Um, on the other side of the business, which isn't necessarily retail, but the smoothie spot, we did set up an online ordering system which was really easy it really wasn't that hard it's not that we don't have a huge menu so it's not a lot of items but initially when restaurants the only thing that they could do was be open for takeout it was great and well i know when the students come back um they used to always phone in orders like they would call the phone would ring all day with that but now we can through email or social media you know, it'll be a little learning curve, a little training for them, but get them to know that that online ordering is available. And I can tell you, they'll rather do that than call on the phone because they'd rather not talk to anybody. They just punch it in and send in their order. So it's, I definitely feel having a better online presence for everyone is something that's just, it'll be good for business going forward. Great. I had a I had a question based on what Jim said, but I, I think it's appropriate to both of you in different ways. Um, and and I want to talk a little bit about your per ticket per visit spend. Like, how are you increasing um, the opportunities for people to spend a little bit more than average? Are you are you putting anything out there? I mean, one thing I thought for Amy is, given the two businesses you have, have you thought about offering insulated cups in winter full of uh, a, a, a smoothie? Um, because it seems like a win-win opportunity there. But regardless, we'll start with Jim. Uh, what are you doing to increase per visit spend? Well, I don't know if we have any uh, real concentrated, focused, um, you know, initiative to uh, to increase the spend on a particular item. We've just been, you know, proactive in seeking uh, items that are more in demand now than they have been prior. You know, so. We're just seeing some strange things that are are in demand. Not so strange. So uh, you know, things that we wouldn't stock normally would be uh, metal stands for uh, dispensers, dispensers and stands. Um, there's just going to be a, an influx or an, a, a huge need for those in all institutions and retail restaurants. Is it's a simply a stand with the uh, uh, you know. Uh, a hand motion sanitizer, right, uh, that you can load. You know, it, so there are little items like that um, that we found some opportunities in in this, I guess. And we weren't really trying, but we just listened to customers, and and they're saying, okay, we're we're going to be needing more sanitizer stations. We're, you know, we're going to need. Um, I'll give you another example. On the food, that was uh, something on the janitorial side and the institutional janitorial side. On the second part of our segment of our business, food service, um, wrap cutlery is in demand. Uh, you know, uh, wrap cutlery is so in demand that we we can't get enough of it. So we're having we're having trouble supplying it, but we have a lot of the the bulk cutlery, the boxes of bulk cutlery that are that are not in such high demand as you can imagine. So um, we found, uh, you know, a solution, um, uh, a bag, uh, a glassine bag, uh, that's for that reason. And so it, it could be, it's a, it's a bag for really metal cutlery, but it works with plastic cutlery. 
and a lot of uh, restaurants and food service establishments have some downtime where uh, some employees could be stuffing those um, at a, a sanitary station where they could be um, taking the bulk cutlery and just putting that together because there's a shortage of the wrap cutlery. So there's that's an example of um, of something that we're we're bumping into opportunities like that among um, in in the midst of uh, you know losing some opportunities. Amy. How are you increasing your per ticket spin or adding value? Yeah, so we, you know, we have done some of that in the past. Like you said, we do carry uh, insulated cups and mugs and things. So we've done it where, you know, if people buy one of those, if you bring that in, I mean, can't do this now, but we were where if you, if you buy a new one, you could do it. We used to have it where if you bought one and then you brought it in, you could, you know, uh, get a discount on your on your smoothie or whatever like that um on the clothing side you know not so much we we usually do you know just discounts or we found that you know we've used the little coupon things and stuff that on the email we use those on the clothing aspect it's a little harder to um add on for stuff on that side than it is on the food side but we uh the food side it's a little bit easier so Oh, a, a quick note too, Matt. Uh, we also, um, I have thought of dispensers too, because we now are uh, considering launching a pretty big campaign uh, to convince folks to get rid of uh, air dry blowers in restrooms and replace them with uh, paper dispensers. Um, so that's a, just another example of an opportunity um, that we're, we've kind of bumped into. I'm curious, um, and this has kind of been a theme throughout the conversation, but you've both mentioned uh, quite a bit leaning into the loyalty that you have or into the existing relationships that you've had with um, with either your community or, uh, and Jim, in your case, the other distributors that you supply to. So I'm wondering, um, have you done anything to try to to leverage that loyalty, any type of loyalty programs or um, just different ways that you're communicating with with your respective audience to, I guess, you know, encourage that loyalty or shop small or shop local. Um, just want, wanting to hear a little bit more about that. Amy, do you want to start out? Uh, so, yeah, we. Um we do have a loyalty program, uh, kind of on both sides. We have one on the smoothie spot that, you know, when you, it tracks your thing through the RPOS system that we use. So if you pay with your credit card, it, you know, it's hooked up to it. Uh, and then we do the same uh, on the clothing side. We have, if you're a customer and you're in our database and et cetera, we usually give you 10% off um, whatever your purchase is for your sale. Uh, but then because we are a, a smaller community and we're really our business district is like a one-way street that goes down, <laughs> um, what we've tried to do is really partner with other businesses. So um, try and do some group things and support each other. Um, we did just, and these were even just for fun, um, but we did some virtual bingo sessions okay, I love <laughs> um, it. not too long ago which worked out well you know we get different things we get freebies from some of our vendors um so we would do virtual bingo where people could sign up through email on like a sunday night and then each of us whoever wins you know we would give away some of the freebies that we get you know we get frisbees from some of the vendors and cups like you were talking about but it was just a way to kind of keep in touch with our community and also people who were um you know who because when they couldn't come into the store it was just something that kind of kept everybody together so it's it, right. one thing i think is it always doesn't have to be a monetary generating um aspect to it but if you can do something a little bit fun that that's how and that's what kind of our our shop is about 
the one thing, and just this is completely different, but it's in regards to the email. The one thing that we have been doing as well, like if we're, if it's a promotion that's running for a little longer than, you know, two or three days, I have found that using that resend to the non openers. Yes. Um, it works. Usually get a, you know, another couple hundred more people who open that. So I think, you know, if there's folks who don't use that or haven't been sure about it, if it's something that is running over a longer time span that you have, hit that button and do it. it you yeah. know, it's only going to send it to the people who didn't open it. And a lot of those times, some, especially with older clients um, or customers, they don't see it or, you know, it's, but we've gotten you know some hits and things from that it, it hasn't been annoying it hasn't caused people to unsubscribe or anything like that it's been a useful tool so that's great i love those ideas especially because um i think people are looking to support local right now and they they want to they want to help their community and so even like you said maybe it not being a monetary value that you're giving them off, but just a way that they can connect within the community, like a virtual bingo. I think that that's a fantastic idea. I love that. Um, Jim, how about you? How are you leaning into those relationships with distributors? But I don't know if we have the, the same type of, uh, of business. You know, we, we definitely, uh, um, we definitely hope that our customers, our loyal customers understand that we're local compared to the competition who are big national conglomerates selling the same product. Um, you know, and then this also gets back to where we add value, Matt, um, is that a lot of times we'll send out a custom, uh, well, we'll send out a contact email promoting product and um, we'll maybe have a note on the emails that sort of reads, hey, do you want to send this to your customers? You know, we can, we can customize it for you, put your logo and contact information and you know so you can send it out um, that's another item that uh, you know both adds value and kind of personalizes and it's something that a, a local company can do a little bit more uh, nimble in a nimble fashion than a, a big you know national conglomerate can by the way Amy I love the um, the idea of resending to non openers and uh, that's a feature that's relatively new to us but uh, um, if there's no harm, just like you said, these are folks that are have an open, so you're not going to get any, or you tend will tend not to get any unsubscribes from that, and it's just a more efficient way to, to send out. I love it. Great. Well, we are coming up to the end of our power hour, so I do um, want to give both of you the opportunity to maybe share something that uh, that's been really important to you, to your success during this time, or anything that we didn't cover that you really wanted to share, um, any other advice or, um, you know, things of that nature with other people that would be in your, in your uh, space. Is there anything that you wanted to, to share with the audience that will be watching this um, later on? Uh, all I would say is that uh, we've been very pleased with Constant Contact lately. We've been reaching out and uh, and using the marketing advisor, and uh, she's come in very handy, great insight, um, and we, which we've learned a lot and used her advice. Um, we've also, um, you know, we, because we're starting to set up more segmented lists for um, even more of our uh our business segments. Um, so that's been a, a great, fantastic thing. I just see more features than I ever have before. I love the new branding, uh, Constant Contacts, new look, and um, I, and uh, I'm just really pleased. And I've been a Constant Contact user for a decade, but I think that uh, uh, they've really stepped up their game. So it's been really helpful for us. Thank you, Jim. That's That's important to us. Thanks for sharing that. Amy, is there any any last advice or any last encouragement you'd like to provide for others in your position? Uh, yeah, I think the biggest thing that I can say is, you know, don't be afraid to try something new. Um, you know, it's especially like with the just email for some people and using a program like Constant Contact, 
can seem scary, but you know, reach out to that little help thing or the little chat thing that pops up or click and don't be afraid because you know, like you folks, you're you're super nice and you're really willing to help people like us who you know don't know that much about it. But if you're willing to try and take the time to do it and you know learn something new, um, and also it doesn't have a huge cost to it. I mean, it costs some of your time, but some of us have a lot more time now to try and figure it out, but definitely um, it, it's well worth it. Give it a try and don't be afraid to do something new. So. Great. Thanks, Amy. Mm -hmm. Matt, thank did you, you have any last thoughts that you wanted to share? I just want to I just want to thank you both so much. Um, it's been such a great hour for me, um, you know, hearing, you know, working in a, in a software company and working remote as we are now. Um, we work on things like the recent and non-openers or the, the the variety of product mix that we have now with website and all these other pieces that we offer now. Um, but to actually hear you say that these things are affecting your business is just fantastic. Um, but I want to uh, congratulate you both because you're both doing a really great job. Like if we have, a, and we don't, but if we had a checklist of the things we'd, we'd want you to do and be trying to do, you're checking off a lot of them. So So kudos to both of you. Awesome. Well, thanks for participating in today's discussion as well, Matt. Um, but yeah, I, th I think I just want to close it out with, you know, letting you all know that Constant Contact is super grateful for your participation and your candidness um, in this discussion today. We are impressed with all that you're doing to power on for your businesses, to try new things, to put yourself out there and to uh, simply just not go down without a fight. And so it, it impresses us. and um, it empowers us to do what we do as well. Um, and we just want to thank you all again for being here today and sharing your story and just to encourage you to keep growing, learning, expanding your business and, and to power on. So uh, thank you for coming today. And uh, it was it was a wonderful discussion. Great. Well, we'll Great. see you thank later. You. <laughs> yeah, of course. We'll see you later and uh, please, please let us know if there's anything else that we can do to um, help you continue with your success. So.